awesome. So, so incredible. You know, uh, Friday night here we had um, our teenage church. Now, Friday night, it's not a youth group, it's actually a teenage church. And uh, these guys do an amazing job and, and every week they're incredible. And last Friday night there we had a fellow come up uh, to visit and visiting ministry and he's got a gift of miracles and he prays for people as well. And we saw so many incredible things happen and, and you know, people filled with the spirit. We saw uh, just miracle after miracle. I love seeing all the social media feeds that come. But there was one guy there, he got shot as a kid. Um, you wonder how that happens, but um, shot by his father and into his shoulder, and he'd lost a lot of movement in his shoulder. And, and quite, you, you quite, it's full on, isn't it? When you think some people's journeys they're, they're on. And he got shot and he'd lost some movement. And um, Friday night, now he, got, he came to youth last week, I think it was the first time. So this was his second week coming to church. And um, on the second week, prayed for him and he got full movement back. He said, I feel a creative miracle. <laughs> That's amazing. So if you need a miracle in your body right now, if you need a miracle in your life, we're just going to pray. And there's people that do. We, I know we've prayed. I know we've prayed for our prayer request. But right now for you, where you are, and I know there's people with incredible needs. Um, and they have needs, and, and we all do to a degree. And we're in a series we're starting called Finding Freedom. And one of the freedoms we need is freedom from sickness and freedom. You know, Jesus paid the price. So if you need a miracle right now, I'm just going to ask you to lay your hand on that area. And if you know and you're sitting next to someone, be it your spouse or your friend, and you know they need a miracle, why don't you lay hands on them right now? We're going to believe God together. Hey, Father, we believe you, that you are a miracle-working God. Father, just as that young man was healed Friday night, just as we see creative miracles again and again and again in lives, Father, we believe you for the miraculous this morning. Healing into bodies right now. Healing into bodies right now. I break the bondage of sickness off people's lives in Jesus' name. Believe you for creative miracles. Reconnection of nerves, Father. Reconnection in part body parts, Father, where people need. Father, where the, in MS, where, that, where that, um, the nerves need healing, Father, and that, that shield come back over those nerves. We believe you for healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I believe God for miracles all the time. Now, as a church, you won't see me operate in the gift of miracles um, very often. Um, I only do it when I feel God speaks to me about it because I think you can, it can become a show and I think it can become uh, around a guru or around someone who's up the front and we expect that. It's not our heart as a church. Our heart as a church that we are all ministers. We're all ministers. It wasn't some special person that's up the front. It's everybody, and I'd love us to catch that. When you see, have a need and you see a need, pray for people. Because it's, not, it's something God said to us. We said, if you believe, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And sure, there's people with a gift of miracles, and that's where we come and we pray for people with that gift. And there's also the scripture, it says, if you are sick, come to the church and the elders will pray for you and anoint you with oil, and we believe that as well. But, but I just want to encourage you as a church, lay hands on people. See the miracles take place. There's nothing more exciting to me than seeing people healed. Uh, and it's not when... I love when, to see the young people come and pray for people. And, and the, the reason I love that is they have no idea. They don't know how to pray. They just lay hands because Jesus said, lay hands and say, be healed. So often it's just such that simple prayer. And we want to see that freedom. And I want to see as a church, we take it to the streets. We don't just take it to, the, to our little holy huddle on a Sunday. Now that's about finding freedom. And as a church, this series is about finding freedom. And I think if you're always plagued by your past, 
and your problems, you won't go into the fullness of your future and your purpose that God has for you. And I think we need to be people who get over our problems. And, but I've found the longer I've been a Christian, the longer I've been on earth, sometimes I, I gather some more problems. And sometimes the things that have plagued me in the past seem to reoccur again. And you go, where did that I thought I dealt with that. And I want to talk a little bit about that this morning, about dealing with those plague problems that come back and harass us. I, I know... I used to be in business and I'd travel all the time and, and I'd travel across to Perth and, and regularly I'd travel, end up, I'd skip across the country. So I'd fly into Melbourne, do some meetings there, then go to Adelaide, then go to Perth. And the difference was when I got to Perth, I found all the people from New South Wales and Queensland and Victoria who were escaping. And they thought, let's change location because if I change location, it's going to be better. And they think, oh, well, look, I'm leaving my problems behind and catch a plane to the other side of the, the nation. And guess what? The problems turned up. It was great for a week. It took them a week to get there. And you hear their stories that, 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 that they're there and they thought, man, it was so good. And then all of a sudden, the same things that I had that were causing me problems on the other side of the nation are here. Because we need to get free of the problem. I know when Moira and I were young, we, we, um, we used to live in a place called Kalala Beach. And it's on Jervis Bay. And it's got beautiful white sand. And it's just an amazing place. It's a lovely place. And we owned a house. It was our first house we bought. We bought it before we were married. Uh, and we had this house. And it was one street back from the beach. Beautiful place. And, and we ended up going. And I was in... Um, electrical contracting and security contracting, that type of work. And we had our own business and, and you know, we had the recession we had to have in 1988. And it's a long time ago. I know most of you guys, a lot of you guys weren't born. But it was one of those things that happened in the, in the past. <laughs> uh, and, you know, 25% interest rates and 17% and on our home loan, 25% on our overdraft in the, in the business. And, you know, Moira and I thought, we'll just escape. Let's go back. We were living in Sydney at the time. We said, let's just go back and live on the beach because it's a lot easier. We actually travelled down to our... We had a weekend there. We travelled down and we looked for another home that was right on the beach. And we nearly bought it. And because we were trying to escape the problems and the challenges that we were living in and we thought the way to do that is change location. It never Worked. We didn't actually buy the house. We should have because it's worth millions of dollars right now. <laughs> but we didn't. You see, we need to settle our yesterdays before we move to our tomorrows. We must settle our yesterdays. Regardless of what you've done or what you haven't done. And I think that's important as well. So you see, we can do some things and we can be regretful of the sin and the things that we've done or decisions we've made, but we can also live in a time where we think, I shoulda. The woulda, coulda, shoulda. And we live in that woulda, coulda, shoulda, and we can not move into our future because we're holding on to the regrets of the things we haven't done. But the beauty is our future's not written. Our future, our future from, from this moment on is not written. And we have the opportunity to rewrite, or not to rewrite, but to write our future from a different attitude and a different point in where we are today, a different vision of what we have. You see, you've got more victories to win. You've got more friends to meet. You've got more of a difference to make. And you've got more of God's goodness to experience. There is incredibly more. I love Ephesians 3. Exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or think. Exceedingly abundantly more. And, I, and you know, so often in Christianity, I, I hear it and I see it. People think Christians shouldn't be, have, shouldn't be blessed. Well, I was at a, a small group meeting on Wednesday night with our young, some of our young adults, and one of the questions was, should I have a nice car? That was one of the questions. You know, you feel the guilt of, of oh, well, maybe I should give everything to the poor. Uh, and you see this pressure coming from the world that, that puts pressure and think, oh, well, as a Christian, I've got to be in poverty. Never what we're called to be. Never what you're called to be. We're called to be generous. 
We're never called to be in poverty. So one of the tricks of poverty is that you, you, the poverty is that you can never get enough. And that poverty is that poverty spirit. But, but God wants us to have more. And he, he says, it says in Timothy to the rich, he says to rich, enjoy what you've got and give to others. Uh, and don't let the, the world contain us to something small, but actually catch to something that's going to take us much larger than where we are. And I think God's called us to that. But the challenge is we have so many of those hang-ups that hold us. Be it sin, be it attitude, be it head attitude, be it heart attitude, that they can hold us back to the destiny and purpose that God has for us. And I don't know about you, I sometimes look at my life and I go, why God? Why didn't you just fix it all up? Because uh, if you've, some of you have heard my testimony, but when I got filled with the Spirit of God, I was, I was a tradie, I was working on building sites, I had our own business at the time, but we were working on building sites and, and we'd ad adopted the language, I'd adopted the language, Moira hadn't, but I had, adopted the language of, of trades. And they're usually small four-letter words. And lots of them. And, and God, that, that night I got filled with the Holy Ghost, it left me. Gone. Totally. And I went to the, the building site the next day and someone swore and it just was somewhat like someone hit me in the, in the stomach. It was, oh, wow. And I thought, this is fantastic. And but through the journey of life, I found that he didn't do everything. He didn't fix up the other attitude problems. He didn't fix up the other sin problems. He actually, and I've talked to him about it. I don't know about, don't know about you, but I actually talk to God and say, God, just fix it. You know, like, do we have to do this? Come on, we could, we could just, you could do this now. But the challenge is he doesn't because he wants to grow us. Imagine, you know, it's like if you've got kids and you give them everything, what do they become? Spoiled brats. And we're like that as Christians. We, you know, sometimes we expect and we expect and we expect and, and we treat God as a, an automatic teller machine and go, God, I need this, I need this, I need this. And he says, well, do it yourself. <laughs> because he wants us to grow. He wants us to be free of the past. And some of those things require us to do that. Some of those things require us to say, okay, I am free. I'm going to take the promise and I'm going to live with the promise and the promise is going to build me. If you're not well in this place, we've got to take the promise of healing and live in that healing and walk in that. And you say, oh, Ken, I've tried that. You've got to keep trying. You've got to keep doing it. There was a preacher, and Smith Wigglesworth, you may have heard of him, but, and he was a, an old preacher and he travelled and he had a healing ministry. He raised the dead. He did a whole pile of things that are quite incredible. And every time he would preach, he'd have these stones, either gallstones or kidney stones, and he would end up lying on the platform in agony. And he would go and pass blood and, you know, just incredible. And, and this is a guy that's seeing miracles all the time. But one day, he got healed. One day, he got healed. You go, well, why didn't God fix him up there? By his stripes, we're healed. There's something about allowing that faith to come and build in us. See, Romans 7, 24 and 25, who will, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, that's faith. Thank God Jesus come to set us free. Thank God he came to set us free, to hold on to him, to hold on to Jesus. I, I love the story of Peter walking on the water. And, and here he is, in, in, you read it in the Bible there in the New Testament, and he's walking on the water, he's called out of the boat, and we love that bit. But the reality was Jesus was wandering past in a storm, and he called him out of the boat. See, sometimes God calls us to do something in the middle of our storm. He calls us to us and he hasn't fixed the storm. He's called us to step into the storm, to walk towards him. When the 10 lepers came to Jesus, and there's so many stories, the 10 lepers came to Jesus and Jesus, you know, these guys were ostracised. They weren't allowed in the town and, and they've walked and they said to Jesus, can we be healed? And he said, he didn't heal them. He said, go and so show the priest. They weren't healed. He said, go and show the priest. And on their way, the Bible says, they were healed. 
Sometimes we have to find freedom in our walk, not just expecting it all to come and say, I'm going to get fixed before I step. I'm going to get fixed before I step. Jesus said, no, 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 just step and you find your freedom. Start to step and you find your freedom. See, God's mercy is new every day. The stepping stone of freedom is mercy. And we step on that step, it's, it's new every day. So it doesn't matter what yesterday looked like. It doesn't matter what your story was yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It's about what you're going to do today if you'll take up the mercy of God. Take up the mercy of God for your healing. Take up the mercy of God to set you free of sin. Mercy is new every day. I've found that in my life as I wander through my Christian journey, and I come back to that point, as I said before, you come back to that point and thought, God, I thought we dealt with this. I don't know about you, but I get frustrated when that happens. That you think, oh, here it is again. I dealt with this. But the reality is, God wants to take us deeper. So sometimes we come and we run into the same thing. We run into it on a different level because God's taking us deeper in, in God. He's taking us deeper in that overcoming. He's taking us deeper to get rid of those things that give us something that's rock solid, not just something that's a fleeting thing that says, oh, yeah, I've overcome, but something that takes us deep and anchored. Ephesians puts it this way. That Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. See, that's when you give your life to Jesus. He makes his home in your heart. And I don't know, maybe you haven't given your life to Jesus in this place today, and maybe you've, you, you've just never experienced that love. We'll give you an opportunity to know him this morning. Because he comes and, and he resides in our heart. But then it says, and I love the next part, your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. See, that's the finding of freedom. The finding of freedom is God comes into our life and sets us free. But to hold our freedom, the roots have to go down deep to hold us strong in Jesus. One of the things I've found, however, is what I focus on becomes my future. And I find it so easy to focus on my problems they seem to pop up and I, I seem to get cranky with myself and I look at my problem and my problem seems to be always in front of me. And what I've found with that, as soon as I'm looking to the problem, I, I'm, I'm drawn to the problem. My future's this way, but my problem is staring me in the face. And instead of looking to my future, I look to my problem and I walk towards the problem. God actually wants us to walk towards our future, to place our eyes upon Him. I find that the challenge for, to find freedom, and, and you'll hear people say, oh, you've got to overcome that problem. You've got to overcome that thing. One of the things I've found is as I face Jesus, all of a sudden that problem gets smaller. All of a sudden I start to overcome that problem. All of a sudden that problem isn't so much in my face because I've started to step towards freedom. We need to be people who look to our future. I think that's why goals are so important. Because goals keep you focused. If you don't write goals down, it's so easy to get shifted one other way. But when all of a sudden, when your goals are there and they're staring at you every day, I find that when I've written my goals down and I start to write them down every year, I try and write my goals down because they speak to me. One of the things I've found is when I do that, I achieve them. If I don't write it down and I don't look at it, I don't achieve it. Then I get frustrated with myself again. And even if I don't meet my goal, because sometimes if you understand my personality, I, I, I like to have, when they call them big, hairy, audacious goals. I like the big goals. I like to put things there that are just impossible and head towards the impossible. Because even if I, if I don't hit the impossible, I hit just under it. I've moved a long way. So I like the big goals that keep me focused. That's why when we, we go, I love... If, if you know that I love adventures and we went around Australia this time last year, we we're actually on the road going around Australia. So while I was watching this service, you're not allowed to tell anybody this, but it's too late because I'm telling you. Um, I was watching the service on Facebook Live as we we're heading down the West Coast. 
um, so I could see what was happening in church. I got the guys to stick it up on Facebook Live for me. Um, so this time last year, but we went around Australia 14 days, 14,000 kilometres. Because I like the big, hairy, audacious goals. I like to be pushed to the limit. And, you know, one of the things about that, and one of the things if you talk to the guys that come with us, you had to get out of bed in the morning. You didn't have an option. You had to get out of the bed at 5 o'clock, and you had to be on the bike by 6 o'clock. Otherwise, you weren't going to make it. And honestly, some of those mornings, you just didn't feel like getting out of bed. Of course, we got in really late the night before because we stopped too long for lattes on the way around. <laughs> but you've got to get out. You've got to do it. And that's something that when we start to head towards freedom, to have our goals that have our future, not our problems, but have our future that will take us forward. 2 Peter 3 verse 18 puts it this way, rather that you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Growth in Jesus should mean that you grow in the love and the care of others. The Bible puts it this way, by this all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. So when we start to look at finding freedom and as we go through this series, we look at how that change brings a change in us and the only way we can measure the change is how we treat others. The change in us, the freedom we find, means that we change the way we view others. We start to change how we see others because the love of God comes into us. And I think it's one of the great challenges to the church, one of the great challenges, the church being the people, being us, is how we relate to the other people. How we relate to the people who don't know Jesus. Do we become these people that are judgmental, that are judge these people that have an opinion, or do we go, are these people that actually have love? When they look at us and go, you're different. You're different. You're not what I expected. Because we have love. The growth in Jesus means that we must become people who love others. Our challenge is when we talk about finding freedom, so often we think it's about attracting more for ourselves than it is. But the more we get, the more we have, the more we can affect but it's about others. So when we find freedom, we find that we're comfortable in ourselves. You shall love the Lord their God with all thy heart, all thy mind and all thy soul. And you shall love your neighbour as you love yourself. But if you've never found freedom and you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbour. If you've never found freedom and you can't love yourself, you can't love your neighbour. Because our worldview, what we look out of as we look at other people, is how we see ourselves. That's why freedom is so, so important. That's why finding freedom is so, so important. Galatians 5, 13 to 14. But you have been called to live in freedom, brothers and sisters. But don't use this freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in one, this one command, love your neighbour as you love yourself. See, when we find freedom, we can be free to be who we are and we can be free to love other people. And the difference of Christianity to anything else is as we give, we receive. As we find our freedom and we give it, what we found in freedom to somebody else, that's when the love grows in us and we receive and we give it again. And it's so opposite. That's why people don't get it. That's why when we, we take an offering up and people say, oh, you want money? We don't need the money. Well, we do need the money, but we don't. It's not about that. It's about people finding freedom in finance. It's about not being killed by that spirit of poverty that locks us in. The, the, the spirit of poverty is that we'll never have enough. And you can be a billionaire with a spirit of poverty. Oh, I've got to look after this pile of dirt. You become like, you know, and money, and you become like Scrooge. Where it's all about the money. It's not it's never about that. It's about our heart. And that's the difference of Christianity, but it's a difference in, in every aspect of it. Not just money, it's every aspect that we give love. And people say, how can you love that person? And honestly, sometimes I say, I don't know. 
but I do. (laughs) Because there's something about as we sow love, we receive love. It's incredibly powerful. The greatest trick the enemy plays, I think, is broken relationships. All through the scripture, and we've read a fair few this morning, looking at how we're called to love others. And that God wants us to love others and says that you'll love others. And by this all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. The greatest trick the enemy can come and bring is the breaking of relationships. And we see it in marriage. Where if he can get and put a wedge into marriage, and I, I call them wedges because I find most things that causes a break of relationship is so small. But if he can get that wedge in and then start to... Hammer it in. He can break the relationship. But it's the same with your friends. It's the same in in your friends in church. Same with the broken relationship. You see, people break relationships with the church because they go, oh, the church. But the church is just people. Church isn't the building. (laughs) Just stops the rain. And Toowoomba, it keeps us a little warmer. It's not that. Church is the people. And if the enemy can break that relationship, you can get opinions, and you know most of us have them. Opinions, that is. They're like armpits. They all stink. But we've all got them. <laughs> and it's the opinions that cause us the difference. But when we find freedom, we find freedom to love people. One of the reasons I think it's so important to have relationships is because if you grow alone, you grow weird. So Moira and I were out in the, uh, our boat. We were heading across to um, have a weekend away and, and, we, and the, where we've got the boat in this marina, we've got, um, we, drive, we drive past this uh, houseboat and it's a mess. And Moira said to me as we were driving past, she goes, there's obviously not a woman in that houseboat. Because when you grow alone, you grow weird. That's why God put men and women together. But it's why he's put us together in, in our small groups. It's why he's put us together in this church. He's why he's put it together with people and relationships. Because community is so, so important. Small groups are a place where, where in, our, in our particular church, it's a place to connect with others. It's a place to protect one another and it's a place to grow together. And I think they're important things. I think it's important that it's a place where we can connect because I know that when we connect, we find there's a richness in connecting. There's a richness in actually meeting somebody else. I think it's important that there's that protection that we are protected together. I think it's important that you can have a small group around you where love covers, where it's a safe place where you can go, man, I am struggling with this sin. And they're there to protect you and love you and pray for you. And a place where we can grow, not just stay small, but people that it challenge us to grow, people who, who push us beyond our limits. Proverbs 28.13 says, People conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn away from them, they'll receive mercy. James 5.16, Confess your sins and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's that community where you can actually be yourself and say, hey, I am struggling. And then all of a sudden, when you get to that point and you can spare it, and sure, we confess our sin to Jesus and He takes it. But if I want to see people healed and where we confess our sin with our friends who'll pray for us and love and hold us accountable, that we actually see the healing take place, the freedom take place. Our friends determine the quality and direction of our lives. I don't know about you, but I shared a little story about working on building sites and how that can affect your direction and quality of your life. And I love hearing Chance's, Chance's story today where he talks about his small group and how it's effect, affected his direction and quality of his life. 
That's why we do small groups. That's why we do community. It's why we actually have that in, incredible opportunity to be involved with other people. So wrap up this morning. Your story is not complete. And God has a great story for you, your future. I'd love you to ask yourself this morning, when you think about finding freedom, what do I need to start doing to move into the direction of the story I want to tell? To ask that question of yourself, because it's so easy to, to sit in church, it's so easy to read a book, it's so easy to do those things and say, wow, that was good, but what step do I need to, what is my next step I need to take to my future? Because the Philippians puts it this way, it's out of the Passion Version. I pray with great faith for you because I'm fully convinced the one who began the glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you and will put his finishing touches into it until the veiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because I think the mess that we find ourselves in today will be the miracle we tell people of in the future. That's our testimony. Because so, I don't know about you, but I know that in my life I'm dealing with a mess. I'm dealing with it and, and I get through this one mess and I get to the next mess. As He takes me deeper in His love. But it becomes my testimony. I overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. So your future is great. Your future is great. Honestly, your future is better than your past. And the reason I can say that confidently is you've got Jesus in your life. But secondly, you've got experience. And you take you into a glorious future. It is an honour to play a small role in what God is doing in and through your life. We believe life is better together and no one should do it alone. So we would love to get connected with you and help you on your next steps with Jesus. Drop us a message on our website or head to our Facebook page.